Hello everyone. In today's video, I'll be presenting to you the meltdown attack. The meltdown attack is used to circumvent memory isolation uh, of modern processes. Through this, um, we can have access to privileged and high sensitive areas of the memory. And we can, for example, get access to keys and passwords. Users with web browsers and who allow code execution, which is uh, nowadays possible through, for example, JavaScript, are especially endangered. Um, this is now part of the video where I usually tell you to update your software and uh, keep your software, um, well, benign. However, in this case, this doesn't uh, really do anything because it's actually an actual hardware vulnerability. Now, before I can explain what Meltdown does, I briefly uh, touch on how processes and programs and memory interact. So whenever you write a program or you start a program or a certain process, um, you might think, okay, well, there are some variables and some data and that's uh, directly accessing the physical memory. Um, for example, your RAM or your hard drive. However, this is not the case. Rather, every process has a dedicated virtual address space in which the process can operate in. And it is not possible to uh, break out of this. You're uh, inside this uh, virtual space and there is a certain mapping that happens which maps this virtual address space to actual physical memory. And if you have many processes running at once, which you usually have, then these have their own, uh, all their own virtual address spaces. So these address spaces do not interact, not interlap, uh, overlap, um, unless they're using, for example, system libraries and they have some shared space. But uh, basically, processes have all their own virtual address space. The next, next thing um, we have to understand is how memory is distributed. We have the user memory and the kernel memory. And the kernel memory, as the name suggests, is operated and managed by the operating system and is where the high privilege stuff, stuff is. So this is not uh, accessible by a user, it's only accessible by the operating system. And the memory space of the kernel memory is shared uh, for all privileged uh, processes and it has actual access to physical memory. So we don't have virtual address space there. However, in the user memory, that's what we basically discussed for the processes right now. It's a low privilege uh, memory so everybody can have access to it. Uh, it's managed by the user or the user processes and the memory space is unique for each process as we've established before and you only have access to your own memory space. You cannot access other memory space than your own. Now we have to look at something what modern uh, CPUs do. Now modern CPUs do something called speculative out-of-order execution. If you write a program and you have four instructions uh, like this for example, uh, what old CPUs did and what you might expect new CPUs to do as well is you go uh, the instructions uh, through one by one. So you just follow instruction one, two, three and four and you only hop to the next instruction when the previous instruction is finished. However, in order to speed things up, modern CPUs can actually um, work in parallel. So while you're evaluating one instruction, which might take a long time, the processor can so the CPU can already uh, evaluate another instruction further down the line. Now this is called speculative out of order execution because it's actually not sure whether this instruction gets called at all. Maybe there's an error before that or maybe there's an if statement before that, which we will come back to uh, in a second. A low level example can be seen here with the assembler code is uh, here. We have the first instruction uh, which moves data, which is always slow. And then we have the following two instructions which just increases and moves pointers. And so while the processor is evaluating this slow function here, it will uh, speculatively uh, and out of orderly uh, evaluate this instruction uh, and this instruction also. Uh, if it's not, uh, well, if, if the uh, instruction number one in this case, for example, is not yet in cache, but if it has to be evaluated anew, it takes a long time. And so he speculatively uh, already evaluates the following instructions. We can look at this uh, high level language here um, where we where we may, maybe see it a bit more clearer uh, and we also um, must look now at the level one cache of the CPU. The level one cache is the fastest cache available to the, pro to the processor and this is where all the speculative um, executions or evaluations are stored. So in this case uh, we have this operation here so calculating an erase length 
usually takes a bit of time. So while the process is evaluating this, he already executes or he already writes this execution into his level one cache. So in his uh, L1 cache, he now has the value um, stored and he also has the actually the whole expression stored. So he has the evaluation of the expression value equals array on the X position. Now, what happens if x is actually uh, larger than the uh, length of the array, uh, which is why we, we, we make this check here, because we don't want to read on a position that's actually larger than the array, because then we get an array index out of bounds exception. And now the, this, this check uh, does, not, um, does not happen when you do this speculative out of order uh, uh, execution. And so if we actually, uh, and the compiler basically says, well, you know, this or during runtime X is uh, larger, so we don't go in there. So you don't get an error, but it has already been evaluated. So what's the deal about that? Well, there is no check uh, regarding access rights uh, in this speculative out of order execution, which means that there is something in the, in the memory now. It's not a value within the array because the array is not as large as X uh, to actually uh, yield the result when I uh, want to evaluate on the X position. However, there is some kind of value. And so and since there is no check regarding access rights, you know, regarding the, the memory or regarding the memory space, I can actually try to choose an X to access kernel space. So if I in my in my address space here on the right and the user memory space, uh, I can actually try to get data from the kernel memory this way. And you might say, okay, well now this is all fine and good. Now I have my value in my level one cache and I can just read this value. Well, unfortunately that's not possible. You cannot read from the level one cache. So what you have to do is you have to do a side channel attack in order to see what value this is. And in order to uh, explain that, we have to look at another example, uh, which we will uh, go through step by step. We again have our CPU, our level one cache, and the program on the right. So we're initializing two arrays. Um, one has a of size 400 and the other one is a very small array. And we have, similar to what we had before, a an evaluation whether an offset, so that's the X from before, but we just call it offset here, uh, is larger or smaller rather than the length of the array. And I can tell you right now, okay, the, the offset is larger. Than the array because we want to trigger this uh, attack. So while the the, the, uh, the CPU is evaluating this, it does the speculative out of order execution and it evaluates value, uh, puts it into its cache. Uh, it evaluates the index, um, which is just basically saying the value which I took, which uh, you can imagine can be either one or zero. So we're talking about bits here, um, and it uh, multiplies basically one or zero with 100. So that evaluates to 100 or zero plus 200. So index is either 200 or 300 based on the value of, well, the variable value. Then there is this uh, evaluation here where the index is uh, smaller than the, the array two. And so in order to make this attack work, this also has to be in cache already. Now I don't, I haven't put it here, but the array's length has to be in cache already because otherwise uh, the, the speculative out of order execution would not be fast enough to evaluate this array's length and the other ones. So the other ones would be uh, finished before that. But let's assume it's in the cache already and now we put value two also in the level one cache. And value two just gives uh, the 200s or the 300s position of array two into the variable value two, right? Um, I will make this, uh, it, it will be a bit more clear in, in, a, in a minute. So anyway, the evaluation is wrong. So offset is larger than uh, the array's length and the program terminates. However, these values are still in cache. So as I've said before, the values are not, it's not only the values that are in the cache, it's the whole expression. The whole evaluation of the expression is in the cache. So what you can imagine is you have like not only value index and value two in the cache, you have value equals array one offset and so on in the cache. And now if you want to know the value of value, you have to, or you can do something called a side channel attack. A side channel attack 
is an attack that's not directly um, targeting, for example, your, your buffers or your cache or your memory, but you try to e evaluate what's inside a memory, a certain memory um, address by uh, using other means, other sites, channels. For example, in this case, we're using a timing attack, which is called uh, that because we measure the time it takes to evaluate a certain statement. And if uh, you can also use, for example, temperature, because CPUs run hotter when they do certain tasks uh, than when they do other tasks. You can also do it with uh, sounds and everything. So, so side channel is everything that's not a direct attack, but like going around the corner in order to uh, infer the data from other data, basically. So in this case, we're going to do a timing attack and we're going to evaluate uh, what takes longer. Does it take longer to load array 2 on the 200th position uh, or does it take longer to load array 2 on the 300th position? And this will become clear because if you think about uh, the so value is a bit and value can either be 0 or 1. So if value is 1, then uh, you can see here that index, so it's like 1 times 100 plus 200, so that's 300. So index becomes 300 and value 2 is the um, is the value at the 300th position. So if I would now compare these two expressions here on the right, uh, whether array 2 uh, on the 200th or on the 300th position is faster, it will yield the result that uh, evaluating it at the, at the 300th position is faster because it's already in cache. Likewise, if value is 0, index becomes 200 and the array 2 on the 200th position would be faster to evaluate. So this is a typical side channel timing attack which has, can be employed uh, for other in other attacks as well but this is how this meltdown this is one of the possibilities how the meltdown act, uh, attack uh, was documented. Uh, the whole attack was documented by Google and they I think the, the final conclusion was that they used or that they were able to do these attacks on a rate of 2000 bytes per second thereby accessing a couple of gigabytes of, well, kernel address space, which you usually should not have access to. So this concludes uh, this video on the Meltdown attack, and I will continue this series with a video on Spectre. And please let me know in the comments whether you want to know or whether you want to have videos on other attacks that, is, that are also using this, this Meltdown, this uh, speculative out-of-order execution, but there are similar or different attacks how to um, actually exploit that. So if you want to have videos about that, please let me know. And uh, if not, then uh, please write a comment anyway, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next video.